Good morning, everyone. A virtual welcome to you. My name is Philippe Leroux Martin, and I'm the Director of Governance, Justice, and Security here at USIP. Assistant Secretary Natali, Assistant Secretary Madison, Ambassador Tan, Deputy Assistant Secretary Gillen, Mr. Kate, Mr. McKennell, and Ms. Kit Kohler, we're very happy to welcome you to USIP this morning, even if we cannot do so in person. The United States Institute of Peace was founded in 1984 by Congress as an independent national institute dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible, that it's practical, and essential for U.S. and global security. We do not only believe that peace is possible, we're actively dedicated to making peace possible wherever we work around the world. We pursue this vision of a world without violent conflict by working on the ground with local partners. We provide people, organizations, and governments with the tools, the knowledge, and training to manage conflict so that conflict doesn't become violent. And we work on resolving conflict when it does. In a seminal speech delivered at the White House in 1999, Eddie Wiesel warned us against the dangers of indifference. He noted that indifference can be tempting, and that it is always easier to look away. He noted also that indifference is particularly dangerous because it reduces victims of atrocities to mere abstractions. He warned us that indifference always benefits the aggressor, but never the victims. USIP is deeply committed to ensuring that we never succumb to the comfort of indifference when we face atrocities. It is in that spirit that this virtual event, co-hosted by USIP and the State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, brings senior officials together to discuss the U.S. government's actions to implement the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act of 2018. USIP's commitment to atrocity prevention goes back a long way. Along with the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and the American Academy of Diplomacy, US served as, USIP served as a co-chair of the Genocide Prevention Task Force in 2008, which laid much of the groundwork for the government's atrocity prevention policy today. In addition, USIP has designed trainings for US government officials on atrocity prevention and researched peace-building tools that may support atrocity prevention efforts. We currently partner with the State Department's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum to research the linkages between atrocity prevention and cross-cutting criminal justice issues to support justice sector actors in better incorporating atrocity prevention into their work. So we're very pleased to have members of the Atrocity Early Warning Task Force with us this morning to discuss their work to improve U.S. policy on atrocity prevention. The Eddie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act of 2018 underscored the commitment of the U.S. government to institutionalizing never again. In the years since the act's passage, the Atrocity Early Warning Task Force has worked to embody this commitment. Yet, much remains to be done to ensure the safety of civilians and communities at risk for atrocities. In countries like Burma, China, Iraq, in South Sudan, marginalized groups and civilians continue to face the risk of atrocities committed by state and non-state actors. So we hope this panel will not only evaluate the work that has been done, but also the work that will happen moving forward to mitigate atrocity risk. I would now like to introduce Assistant Secretary for State for Conflict and Stabilization Operations, Dr. Denise Natali, who will provide introductory remarks. Dr. Natali and the bureau she leads serve as the task force's secretariat, coordinating the task force's work and helping to advance its priorities. And following Dr. Natali's remarks, Ms. Naomi Kikkoler from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum will introduce our panelists and lead our discussion. Dr. Natali, once again, thank you for joining us and over to you.
No. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like to share the story of Sarah Gold Southbay, who was awarded the Department of State's International Women of Courage Award this year. Sarah Gold Southbay, I'm muted. Okay, just a second. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm not muted. I'm not muted. We're good. Are we good? We Sarah can hear you well. You, you can hear me. Sarah Gold Southbay, excuse me was born in Eli Autonomous Prefecture, Xinjiang, China. She attended medical university and worked as a doctor, a teacher, an education director, and headmaster. In July, 2016, Sarah Gol and her family attempted to move to Kazakhstan, but the Chinese Communist Party confiscated her passport and prevented her from going with her husband and children. From November, 2017, to March 2018, Sarah Gul was forced by the Chinese Communist Party to teach Chinese to ethnic minority people in a detention camp. In March 2018, Sarah Gul fled to Kazakhstan to avoid being sent back to the camps where she feared she would die. Subsequently, Sarah Gul became one of the first victims of the world to speak publicly about the Chinese Communist Party's repressive campaign against Muslims, igniting a movement against these abuses. Her testimony was among the first evidence that reached the broader international community of the Chinese Communist Party's repressive policy, including both the camps and the coercive methods used against Muslim minorities. Sarah Gull and her family received asylum in Sweden, where they now live. Sarah Gull is not alone in her suffering. Her traumatic situation is one of the many human rights violations perpetrated by the Chinese government against ethnic and religious minorities. According to the Department of State, since 2017, Chinese authorities have indefinitely detained between 800,000 and 1 million Uyghur, ethnic Kazakhs, and other Muslim minorities. They are forced to live in nearly 1,200 newly constructed re-education camps, or in the Chinese government's words, vocational training centers, where they are exposed to heinous treatment. This administration is committed to making sure that atrocities such as these do not occur. The December 2017 U.S. National Security Strategy affirms that the United States has a vital interest in protecting civilians like Sarah Gould and her family from atrocity crimes. The National Security Strategy states, we will hold perpetrators of genocide and mass atrocities accountable. President Trump has further reaffirmed that atrocity prevention is a core U.S. national security interest when he signed the Eli Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act in January 2019. The goal of the Eli Wiesel Act is to enhance the U.S. government's capabilities and efforts to prevent, mitigate, and respond to atrocities globally. Since President Trump signed the Eli Wiesel Act, the U.S. government has enhanced its early warning capabilities and our efforts to mitigate atrocities. And I'd like to emphasize that our, our work and our efforts to mitigate atrocities and to implement the Eli Wiesel Act differ from previous atrocity prevention initiatives. Mm -hmm. We are moving beyond studying and conceptualizing risks to taking timely actions that effectively enhance civilian security. As the Secretariat for the National Security Council's Atrocity Early Warning Task Force, my bureau, the Bureau of Conflict, um, and Stabilization Operations, CSO, at the State Department is and has developed atrocity response action plans based on three lines of effort, prevention, prosecution, and prevention, excuse me, protection and prosecution. First, prevention. To prevent attacks against civilians, we are using data-driven assessments to locate where atrocities are occurring at the local levels, who are the victims, the perpetrators, and identifying government responses. We're also identifying new data sources at local levels, 
using satellite imagery to enhance these efforts. We're closely collaborating with the interagency, including the intelligence community, as well as our civil society partners to ensure that our efforts in our officers in the field have updated data and assessments on atrocity risks so that they can better target their efforts. CSO has also developed the State Department's first online atrocity prevention course, which has trained over 1,200 foreign affairs staff to date on identifying early warning indicators and taking action against potential atrocities. Secondly, our action plan protects at-risk civilians. The United States is training national security forces to pre prevent atrocities and to protect civilians in targeted locations. Our diplomats are working to build trust and inclusive feedback loops between national security forces, local community leaders, and non-state armed groups so that we can enhance local security. We are training and mobilizing faith-based and traditional leaders to convene community conflict resolution initiatives. And we are ensuring that women play meaningful roles in preventing and resolving conflict. Conflict-related sexual violence is both an early warning sign for atrocities and atrocity crime in and of itself. Third, we are prosecuting perpetrators and holding them accountable for atrocities. This effort includes gathering data on the ground to identify the perpetrators, building the capacity of justice sectors to preserve evidence and to prosecute, and applying sanctions and visa restrictions against perpetrators. Each of these lines of efforts that we have developed includes working closely with our international partners to share information and to assure burden sharing. It also includes using metrics and ongoing assessments so that we can assure impact is tied to clear policy outcomes. Our approach is about targeted, actionable, and effective interventions. When we say never again, it must mean more than words. It must mean taking clear and timely action. Sarah Gold's story, and I'd like to, to, to conclude, and that of hundreds and thousands of ethnic and religious minorities still detained under inhumane conditions in China's re-education camps, reminds us of the noble call to action from Eli Wiesel, who boldly stated, we must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Whenever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at the moment, become the center of our universe. Again, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for this important event that is being conducted and helping us to all work together so that we can achieve impactful results that save lives. Thank you for your participation today. Thank you very much, Denise, for that uh, introduction and for starting us off in, in such a strong way to talk about the work that the task force has been doing and the implementation of the Elie Wiesel uh, Genocide Prevention Act. Uh, every government over the last 25 years has tragically had to deal with the commission of genocide and large-scale mass atrocity crimes on its watch. Uh, this is an issue that truly is a bipartisan issue. And I think the fact that we are coming together today to talk about the work of the task force, compelled in large part um, by the work that Congress has done to enact the act and to create reporting requirements, which is such a critical uh, role that Congress has to play in pushing for transparency and accountability in the efforts that the U.S. government is undertaking to advance atrocity prevention is, I think, a, a really positive sign. Uh, it's important to acknowledge the, the leadership that has been undertaken by the current and the past administration when it comes to actually trying to institutionalize atrocity prevention. And I, I do want to acknowledge not just the congressional leaders, but also uh, each of you and those before you who've been working on trying to advance this agenda, and especially to those at the working level who day in and day out uh, seek to find creative ways to find strategies to, at an early stage, address early warning signs 
and take steps to try to help save lives. Uh, we have an opportunity to hear from uh, a number of key principals that are, are leading some of those efforts uh, over the course of the next hour or so. Uh, and I wanted to start by posing a question to the Assistant Secretary of State, Stephen Gillen. Uh, Steve has a, a long career as a Foreign Service officer and has worked in some of the most challenging uh, environments when it comes to actually seeing uh, the early warning signs and the consequences of inaction uh, be that from Sarajevo, Kosovo, to more recently, Iraq. And Steve, I wanted to ask you to build on uh, an element of issues that have been touched in the most recent task force report, but also in the 2019 report to Congress. Um, one of the big challenges that many of us face working on atrocity prevention is how to overcome what appears to be at times a divide uh, within not just the Secretary of State, but uh, within many departments, uh, true also for the United Nations and other governments as well, uh, between the kind of regional and functional sides of the, the House. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what can be done to better address the difference in perspectives and also at times in the, the perception of the mission of uh, the regional and functional bureaus. Good morning, Naomi. Thanks so much. It's a great question. I want to thank also uh, USIP for hosting me today and thankful, thank my uh, fellow panel members for allowing me to join you. Uh, it's a great question, as I said. Uh, uh, mo as most of you are aware, uh, there are both functional regional bureaus in the st State Department. And I can tell you from my own experience, having served in both kinds of bureaus and currently in a, in a functional bureau, that the priorities and equities and areas of focus for both are unsurprisingly very different. I'm fortunate enough to serve in the, uh, currently serve in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, which as I said, is a, is a functional bureau. And as such, I get to advocate um, working towards aggressively promoting democracy, human rights, labor globally. I've previously served in regional bureaus uh, and those regional bureaus have a different focus, but the mission in the end is the same. Look, the tenets that I've, um, advocating for as part of my duties in the DRL Bureau are central to American values and important to support, not only for reasons of our values, but also for strategic reasons. Uh, our colleagues in the regional bureaus, and I know from my own experience, having worked in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs, for example, uh, our colleagues in the regional bureaus support the same aims, but also must manage the bilateral relationships, the regional dynamics, security partnerships, and a host of other concerns. Occasionally, that means uh, that a given post or embassy or country team may need to prioritize another area or equity, uh, not to the detriment of human rights or democracy, rather to focus on another facet of foreign policy. This is a very important question, though, this difference of how you approach different bureaus and how you enhance one bureau's uh, ability to, to uh, get buy-in throughout the department, their particular department or agency in the U.S. government. And understanding how to do that, is, I think, is key to uh, addressing atrocities prevention issues. My experience has been, having been on both sides of, of the fence on regional bureaus and functional bureaus currently, is in the long term, rectifying human rights violations, human rights abuses, preventing atrocities uh, that will result in mass human rights abuses is in the U.S. strategic interest because it shapes the, our future partnerships and the security arrangements moving forward. And I think my fellow Foreign Service officers out of post in the regional bureaus understand this. In the short term, of course, we depend on you outside the U.S. government to help bolster the relationships we have inside the department within the U.S. government by raising attention and making those connections between the strategic relationships and the human rights abuses and uh, potential future uh, atrocities. But thanks again, Naomi. That's a really important question. Just kind of following up on that, um, and I do want to just take a moment just to uh, remind the audience that you can pose questions uh, for when we open up to the question and answer um, in the chat function. Uh, but Steve, you know, one of the the challenges is at times there appears to be um, a tension, as though it is an, an either or, and one way of overcoming coming that perception that uh, there are these either-ors that you can only act uh, to advance national security interests 
if you forego, in some cases, human rights concerns or concerns about early warning signs of, of mass atrocities, is through uh, enhanced training and through exposure and uh, engagement with staff throughout the uh, the Department of State. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what some of the steps have been in a concrete way over the past year to try to ensure that uh, officials are being trained in understanding the early warning signs to look for, understand the chains of reporting, uh, and also have a better understanding of the tools that are available to try to prevent atrocities so that we are not stuck in this uh, constant back and forth uh, debate over whether or not taking steps to mitigate risks might undermine other uh, security interests. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for that follow-up question. Look, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, the key to to solving kind of what are, as you descri rightly described, tensions, albeit my experience, friendly tensions with uh, tensions among offices and bureaus, the departments and agency is creating an understanding, even among those who serve in the uh, bureaus that are usually more focused on bilateral relationships, security arrangements, and not as much on the human rights dimension or maybe the atrocities prevention. But I think this is, was part of the benefit of the capacity building kind of built into the Elia Vizel Act. As you know, it re requires uh, prevent, uh, atrocity prevention training for foreign service officers who will be assigned to countries experiencing or at risk of mass atrocities and our, uh, and our team created a class, as was mentioned, uh, now offered at Foreign Service Institute for those foreign service officers, like my, like my uh, colleagues, across both functional and regional bureaus of the department and out overseas posts. Um, during these trainings, officers are introduced to concepts that help them recognize the patterns of escalation, early warning, as you say, and uh, signs of potential atrocities and methods and, uh, for preventing and responding to those atrocities. And we in Washington have to have the data and reporting to feed into the policy process. In practical terms, what that means is enabling me, people, my colleagues in the DRL Bureau and the CSO Bureau to get with our regional bureau colleagues and say, here's the proof of what's going on and let us help you uh, connect the dots for how it is in American strategic interests as well and the bilateral relationships interests as well uh, to make those connections. Um, you know, besides, Kind of the requirements of the Elliot Vizel Act uh, is laid out in the training. Uh, you know, we've also uh, been leading forward uh, to in our training, uh, atrocities prevention training out in the field. In December of 2019, for example, uh, we had the, we held the first ever regional uh, atrocity prevention training in South Africa in December 20, uh, December 2019. As I said, for personnel from 28 uh, U.S. missions, embassies around the world. Or, across Africa in conjunction with the Auschwitz Institute uh, for Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocity. I think these kinds of trainings, alerting foreign service officers out in the field who have this special relationship with the regional bureaus, which are charged with maintaining um, uh, lines of communication with their posts out in the field, is critical in the short run to, to help us and those functional bureaus that are focused on atrocities prevention. But in the long run, they also create a culture among foreign service officers and US government personnel writ large to be more sensitive and kind of speak the language of atrocity prevention. So when they come back for Washington assignments, they've already developed that way of communicating, presenting and making the case for stepping in as necessary. I hope, I hope, I'm happy to say it's a great question. I'm happy to say more, but I hope that's, that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think you know your, your comments kind of echo an aspiration that we and many others have that essentially what we're trying to do is make uh, atrocity prevention rote, develop the muscle memory uh, so that we have folks across the system understanding what to look for and how to respond when they do see warning signs. Um, and of course, that leads to, I think, a really important question about uh, what are the assets that are available to help advance both early warning, but in those situations where unfortunately um, we see prevention fail, what is the response that might be possible uh, and steps that can be taken to help protect civilians. And with that, I wanted to turn to uh, David Kate, the director of the atrocity, uh, director for atrocity prevention policy in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, David, it's a, a pleasure to be able to, to hear from you. Uh, I think that one of the areas that um, we don't often 
touch as much on is the role of the Secretary of Defense and DOD in atrocity prevention. And so I just wanted to start by uh, having you describe a little bit your perspective of how atrocity prevention fits into DOD's work. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to uh, USIP for hosting this and inviting us. Um, it's a great question. DOD does, in fact, have significant capabilities to um, conduct security sector reform um, to help prevent atrocities. Our institutional capacity building programs are at the center of our efforts to support SSR. These programs work to improve institutional functions and processes of our foreign partners. Uh, we're also increasing our efforts to build the legal institutional capacity of our partners to support the protection of civilians uh, consistent with the law of armed conflict and human rights law. We work with partners to improve their ability to investigate incidents of civilian casualties uh, and to establish mechanisms for effective civilian oversight of defense and national security legal institutions. One of our more SSR Focus programs is likely engaged in the majority of countries in the world. Our, our regional centers, which seek to engage most countries in their assigned regions, work to positively influence the development of partners' security structures such that those structures are appropriate for democratic states. Our more focused and targeted efforts, implemented by the Institute for Security Governance, the Ministry of Defense Advisors Program, and our Defense Institute of International Legal Studies are conducted in roughly 50 countries around the world. Since about 2006, when DOD began to provide training and equipment to partner nations, a program called Section 1206, we have addressed human rights in the countries whose militaries we have trained and equipped. And in recent years, we have paid even greater attention to human rights training. Current law requires that we conduct both institutional capacity building and human rights training in countries where we provide equipment and training. These SSR efforts broadly seek to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of partner nation defense and security establishments, including by focusing on human rights and respect for civilian control of defense and security forces. By professionalizing defense and security forces and conducting human rights training, we can work to improve the behaviors of security forces their respect for human rights and for civilian control of the military. So while DOD is working on a number of initiatives to improve its training of partner security forces on IHL and human rights, we also need to provide better education and training on atrocity prevention uh, matters for our own people, including on the tools the department can bring to bear. U.S. military personnel receive training on human rights and international humanitarian law when they join their services, but this is not enough. To improve our ability to engage more robustly in atrocity prevention, we plan to adapt training materials that our State Department colleagues uh, were gracious enough to provide um, into our DOD training. With greater awareness of atrocity risk indicators, DOD personnel will be better prepared to facilitate planning and the conduct of appropriate capacity building efforts. Um, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on um, a protection of civilians as kind of a discrete topic. Uh, in FY18, Congress asked us to provide a joint DOD and state plan for how we would build internal USG capacity to actually conduct uh, protection of civilians related activities through our principal DOD training program. Um, that, that effort is underway. We provided the plan about a year and a half ago. Um, and there are three fundamental phases. The first is kind of an internal stock taking on what capabilities we have, developing doctrine and SOPs and things like that. Um, we're, we're in the middle of kind of phase one still. Phase two would be to conduct actual pilot programs. And phase three is to think through uh, more deeply probably what actual capabilities we have to actually conduct these events um, specifically targeted at protection of civilians and to make sure that we you know establish all the appropriate monitoring and evaluation and learn from what we're doing so that we can come back and improve our own our own processes so uh, in conclusion you know DoD does have significant capabilities to engage in atrocity prevention through security sector reform we look forward to even greater collaboration with the interagency and with our like-minded international partners to take 
all of this work forward. And I look forward to the rest of the panel and any questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, one quick follow-up. Uh, do you have a timeline for the phased approach that you're referencing in regards to working with state? Because uh, from our own experiences, even uh, the work that we were doing in Iraq, it was remarkable to see uh, the amount of information that DOD uh, and your colleagues actually had about the communities on the ground and some of the unique risks that they face. So it's heartening to hear that there is more of a dialogue now about how to actually work in a coordinated, coordinated manner around early warning so that, that information can be shared throughout the, the system. Um, so I, I can't comment specifically on you know, the timeline. This is a, we're, we're a large ship, it takes a little bit of time to turn some things. Um, I, would, I would come back to probably the Atrocity Early Warning Task Force um, and the mechanisms, uh, you know, there's been a lot of energy in the last, you know, year or so um, to try to make sure that our interagency coordination um, and the Atrocity Early Warning Task Force processes for um, ensuring that we all get together regularly and uh, drill down on certain countries, that leads us to you know, reach out to all of the providers of different kinds of activities uh, within the Department of Defense, um, to our folks at embassies, um, to, to really pulse them on these issues. And that work has begun, um, and I think is, is showing some promise, certainly, and, and, and will show much more in the future. Thank you for that. Um, and I just want to acknowledge all the incredible work that's been done by many people on advancing the work that you referenced around protection of civilians and the mass atrocity response operations work to help enhance the training uh, uh, and the capacity building of um, your own forces. So thank you very much for that. I wanted to pick up on a theme that um, Denise touched on, which was around uh, prosecutions, but also the relationship between international justice and prevention uh, and shift a little bit to um, worst hand, the uh, ambassador for global criminal justice. And Morse, I, I was hoping that you could comment and uh, explain a little bit from your office's perspective what the U.S. approach is to going about making determinations that uh, atrocity crimes have occurred. We've had some experience working with you and others when it has come to genocide determinations in the context of Iraq. And most recently, uh, we were heartened to see the efforts that were taken by the Department of State to do such a thorough documentation of the crimes that have taken place against the Rohingya by the uh, Burmese Hatmada. Uh, which translated into a finding of kind of ethnic cleansing, which isn't a traditional legal term. And I'm curious uh, because this has been an ongoing discussion within many circles within Washington about how does the U.S. government make these determinations? How do you see the relationship between that process and, uh, and prevention? <laughs> Unmuting would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> so um, I first want to express my gratitude to the U.S. Institute of Peace for convening this important meeting on this uh, very important topic. I also want to express my gratitude to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum back when I was a law professor before assuming my present position I uh, benefited by attending your Sudikov seminar on the prevention of mass atrocity crimes and had a couple of my now colleagues uh, David Mandel Anthony and Ari Bassin uh, accompany me in that. Um, I want to say as a general proposition that an ounce of prevention can be better than a pound of cure uh, that is, I think, a general maxim that can help to guide us. But to go more specifically to your question about atrocity determination, um, I'd like to first recommend to, the, to those who are listening, um, one of my predecessors in this office, Ambassador Todd Buckwald, wrote an excellent piece that lays out this whole subject uh, quite capably, and I would commend that work to you, but uh, in a much shorter way and uh, to address it partially 
uh, here in this context. Um, let, let me see if I can make a few points along these lines. Making the decision as to whether to characterize a situation as a specific atrocity situation, namely as genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and or ethnic cleansing, which you correctly noted is not a legal term, is a serious one. Many governments will not make such statements officially at all, preferring to leave the question to judicial bodies, particularly in the case of the three atrocity crimes. U.S. similarly leaves this question to the courts in most cases. However, on a handful of occasions, the Secretary of State has determined whether the U.S. government should publicly characterize particular abuses as genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and or ethnic cleansing. The process for how the Secretary makes an atrocity determination has varied over the years, but since the U.S. ratified the Genocide Convention in 1988, there have been two common elements. First, there is an analysis of all the facts, including classified information uh, that are available to the United States. There may be times when the U.S. will spend resources to seek out additional facts prior to making a determination. Second, there is an application of the facts to law to determine if the terms are legally available. Might be useful here to note that the law here refers to U.S. law or U.S. interpretations of international law. So, for example, if we were to review whether genocide has taken place, we would look at the federal genocide statute as well as the genocide convention, including any U.S. understandings about the convention. There is no automatic trigger for atrocity determination. The absence of a U.S. atrocity determination does not necessarily mean that the specific atrocity is not taking place or that the U.S. government believes that the atrocity is not taking place. Determinations can be an important policy tool and can be useful to combat disinformation, help galvanize international support for justice and accountability, encourage humanitarian assistance, prevent further atrocities, and promote respect for human rights. From my perch in the Office of Global Criminal Justice, the most important thing is that we are taking action to prevent atrocities, to bring justice to the victims of atrocities, and to hold accountable those who are responsible for atrocities. A determination may be an important tool for us to achieve our goals, but is not the end goal in and of itself. Thanks so much, Morris, for that. Um, I think that, you know, it is obviously uh, a question uh, and a conversation that relates very much to not just at times legal questions, as you outlined, but there is also political uh, dimensions that often factor into the process of making determinations. Um, and I would point people to the report that, that Morse highlighted. Um, it's available on the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's website and chronicles past efforts by the U.S. government to, to make determinations. As Morse mentioned, uh, the U.S. government is one of the only governments that actually at times has undertaken it, but there is no uh, one clear kind of common approach. I think from our perspective, it is very important to call crimes by their names. But as you mentioned, we need to see a wide array of tools used to uh, try to protect communities, especially in situations like the Rohingya, where the risks remain ongoing and where the risk of genocide persists. In that vein, I wanted to just ask a follow-up question around what are some of the other transitional justice tools that uh, your office seeks to help and advance um, in specific cases where you do believe that atrocity crimes have been, been taking place? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, there are an array of transitional justice tools that we employ, uh, whether it's truth and reconciliation commissions, whether it is uh, a hybrid tribunal that is part domestic and part international, and not only tries to address particular mass atrocities, but tries to build capacity for the domestic system moving forward. Sometimes these domestic systems are destroyed in the wake of a war or uh, things along these lines. Um, there, there is uh, really an array of different things. Uh, lustration, uh, not permitting those who have committed uh, past crimes along these lines to 
hold uh, positions of trust and responsibility. But let me see if I can get into uh, get into some specifics uh, along these lines. Um, the State Department has been supportive uh, of a new trend in international criminal justice development of international information gathering mechanisms. In Syria and Iraq, these have taken the form of the International Impartial Independent Mechanism, also known as the IIIM, responsible for the most serious crimes under international law committed in the Syrian Arab Republic since 2011. Created by the UN General Assembly in 2016 and the UN investigative team against Daesh, uh, ISIS, um, that acronym is UNITAD, created by the Security Council in 2017 to collect, store, and preserve evidence of ISIS atrocities that may amount to genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And some of this information has been used in domestic prosecutions already. To date, the department has provided two and a half million to the IIIM to help its efforts in Syria and three million to UNITAD to support its efforts, including one million JCG, GCJ provided to UNITAD with fiscal year 2018 funds. Importantly, the department also supports a number of civil society groups, including Syrian and Iraqi groups to document and analyze evidence of human rights abuses and shared this evidence with the IIIM and UNITAD. While neither the IIIM or UNITAD are prosecutorial entities in their own right, the evidence each is gathering is being used, as I mentioned, uh, by national prosecutorial entities in Europe and by our own law enforcement in actionable prosecutions to help facilitate and expedite fair and independent criminal proceedings in countries that may have jurisdiction over these crimes. The work of both bodies also provide important transitional justice purposes, such as memorializing atrocities and what happened to victims, possibly serving as a deterrent to other perpetrators, and helping survivors feel as though what happened to them is being taken seriously. The U.S. is supportive of commitments by our partners and allies to contribute financially to our shared goals. As you may recall, around April of 2020, UNITAD and the European Union announced the EU would provide three and a half million euros to UNITAD to begin a digitization and archiving project of ISIS crimes in Iraq. UNITAD will provide technical assistance and training to Iraq to support the central government and Kurdistan regional government developing a comprehensive indexed inventory of ISIS crimes in Iraq. The contribution is the largest UNITAD has received to date and complements continued effort, continued support of accountability efforts. We also have a war crimes rewards program. Another area uh, that we uh, work in, this unique program offers rewards of up to $5 million for information that leads to the arrest, transfer, or conviction of certain individuals wanted for war crimes, genocide, or crimes against humanity by international hybrid or mixed tribunals. Over the life of the program, we have contributed to more than 20 cases. Right now, the program is focused on the six Rwandans still at large and won by the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, also known as the MICT, for the rules in the genocide. One Rwandan who was designated, Felician Kabuga, was recently arrested in France. Uh, Kabuga was the chief financier of the Rwandan genocide and also was very much involved in the incitement thereof. Through, through the rewards program, we work closely with the mechanism and international partners on these cases. We also have a tip line where individuals can confidentially submit information. I might just mention that Netflix recently had a program, The World's Most Wanted, which included Felicia and Kubuga, uh, who after being at large for over 26 years uh, was captured. I'd like to turn also to the South Sudan. The US has been clear that accountability is necessary to break the cycle of, cycles of violence that plagued South Sudan. We continue to urge the government of South Sudan to work with the African Union to establish the hybrid court and the other transitional justice mechanisms provided 
provided for in the peace agreement signed just over two years ago to address the root causes of the conflict and meet the needs of victims. And finally, let me mention about the Western ba Balkans. Over 20 years since the end of conflicts in the Balkans, we continue to support uh, justice for victims of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. We look forward to the conclusion of proceedings against three senior leaders, in, including Ratko Mladic at the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, and support the Kosovo Specialist Chambers as it moves to address the confirmation of charges in a number of cases, uh, including a well-known case in regards to the head of state. We also support the national courts, which have taken on the work of securing justice for the crimes that were not addressed by the international courts, as this work is critical to promoting the rule of law and addressing the harms done to victims in conflict. Thank you, Morse, for that um, and for giving such a detailed overview about the type of work that you're doing to try to enhance the capacity at the local level of uh, justice actors, which I think dovetails with the work that um, David and others have been talking about and feeds well into uh, Kirsten's work. Um, so I wanted to talk, uh, turn to Kirsten Madison, the Assistant Secretary of INL. Uh, Kirsten, we've had the privilege of working with your team on an initiative on how to train uh, local uh, security, law enforcement, uh, and judicial actors on understanding early warning signs of atrocity prevention. One of the big challenges that we face in the atrocity prevention field is how to draw uh, connections and find the intersection between different agendas. Um, and one of those agendas is women, peace, and security. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, because it was not highlighted in depth in the, in the last report, uh, around what some of that work looks like for your team and your approach to looking at related agendas and bringing them together. Hey, I've passed the first hurdle. I found my mute button. Um, thanks very <laughs> much uh, for, it's so hard sometimes, uh, for including us in this panel. It's such an important conversation. Uh, and I'm reminded uh, from Morris's uh, intervention and Stevens, um, you know, INL is a programmatic organization. We're a foreign assistance organization, but there's a huge amount of work. We, we, our work comes in the context of the, of the diplomacy to build will and to highlight these issues uh, that, you know, the, the regional bureaus lead. Uh, and then thematically, folks like Morris lead in a very focused way. Uh, and I think Morris mentioned civil society, that connective tissue, which DRL is really great at uh, forming, but to civil society in countries, there's a connective tissue that has to be formed there uh, that connects to these issues. Um, so our work happens in the context of many other pieces of this puzzle, some of which is DRL, great diplomacy by Morris and, and, the, and the teams that are led by the regional bureaus. For INL, we have programming in 90 countries around the world. Uh, many of those countries are at risk for atrocities. Uh, and our goal everywhere uh, is to increase the legitimacy of criminal justice institutions and, and help them become more responsive to the needs of citizens. You know, a truly functional justice system ensures that all citizens, including marginalized groups, can be heard, uh, can have their grievances addressed in the context of the structure of the law. So we are always working to promote criminal justice systems that equally serve all citizens, that balance public safety and the rule of law, at the same time respecting human rights and sort of individual fundamental freedoms. That could be challenging in some places. Uh, and we're very conscious of the fact that the, that the, often the sort of one piece of the state that citizens see might be the cops on the beat or the, or the individuals that represent the states in their community. Uh, and that's that sort of connective point where the question of whether or not the state is seen as legitimate and whether or not those who are governed uh, uh, trust, have trust and confidence in those who govern them is kind of decided. So we think it's really important. Uh, in line with the women uh, peace and security strategy, we really do, just to get more specifically focused on what, you, what you've asked about, uh, we pr very specifically work to promote the participation of women as police and other criminal justice practitioners. Uh, we think it improves understanding uh, and it improves the response to crime in communities. 
In fact, I think the research shows that there's a very positive correlation between, between the percentage of women in police uh, and reporting of crimes, including sexual assault and domestic violence. Uh, and policemen, women are less likely to use ex excessive force than their male counterparts. Uh, and I think it's absolutely critical uh, if you're trying to address issues like um, sexual and gender-based violence that, 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 that you have women in the system who are shaping how the system responds to, to, to those issues. Um, and we work very closely in INO uh, with our counterparts in partner countries to increase accountability uh, for sexual and gender-based violence. Um, intercommunal sexual and gender-based violence obviously uh, is a, can be a component of atrocities. It also can be a sort of flashpoint that drives increased violence and, and sort of sends countries on a, on a bad trajectory. Uh, sometimes, if, you know, we meet countries where they are uh, and where, where we can shape what they do and how their institutions are functioning. So sometimes our, our programming in this area can be specifically designed to prevent and to increase accountability or we may have to focus sort of uh, more broadly because of where they are on building the capacity of criminal justice institutions and actors to hold perpetrators accountable uh, for sexually and gender-based uh, violence uh, and very specifically to increase access to justice uh, for survivors. So we, for example, might be educating magistrates, investigators, prosecutors, court staff, lawyers, on how to conduct investigations, prosecutions, uh, to manage trial and evidence uh, management, uh, and engage with survivors and communities uh, in what is a very sort of um, difficult and fraught area. Uh, and I think if you looked, um, for example, in a place like uh, Afghanistan, um, you know, we have been working in Afghanistan with a goal of prevention. Uh, but also increasing accountability for sexually and gender-based violence. Um, and we helped the Attorney General's Office in Afghanistan establish, train, and mentor a specialized uh, set of prosecution units that are focused on violence against women. Uh, and, you know, that's sort of a, it, it's a long haul thing. You don't do that overnight. Uh, it takes a lot of dedication on our part. It takes a lot of diplomacy uh, to bring uh, the, the government uh, forward on this when they have so many other things to focus on. Um, but the reality is that the Afghan government has actually expanded those units um, a, a, a across the country uh, and that we, we've seen a rise in prosecutions of crimes involving um, sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, it doesn't, again, it doesn't happen overnight. So I think, you know, under the nest of the diplomacy and the larger goal of, of the U.S. Of, of addressing these issues, we bring the programmatic resources to the table and we try to do very practical things, long haul institution building that actually um, bolsters the ability, the capability and the will of governments to take this on. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Kirsten, and for going to such detail with the example uh, around Afghanistan. I think, you know, with some humility, we can look at even, uh, events that have been transpiring here in the United States to see how critically important it is for there to be trust in security, uh, in the security sector, in the rule of law, um, and how critical that is to a, a functioning democracy where atrocities are prevented. Uh, so very much appreciate your, your explanation there um, and also the acknowledgement of just as with so many of the efforts that each of you have spoken about, uh, how long-term that investment is and it really does underscore why this commitment to atrocity prevention cannot be merely something that is picked up by one administration, forgotten by another. We need to see the continuity of the investment and training in the capacities of U.S. officials, but also in the partner countries and individuals and local civil society that you're working with, which is why conversations like this uh, right now are, are so important, explaining what your work looks like uh, and also the continued reporting and engagement with Congress is so critical. Um, with that, I wanted to turn just for the kind of last set of questions um, to, to USAID before we open it up to 
those who are, are viewing and I'm grateful to have Ryan McCannell participate on behalf of USAID. Ryan is the director of the Center for Conflict Prevention. I should say that everyone who has participated has a truly remarkable background and varied um, background having worked throughout uh, the, the US government and with uh, civil society as well. I did notice, Ryan, that you worked for the Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute, which has done really important work uh, on uh, atrocity prevention and looking at these particular issues. I wanted to talk to you um, and ask, because USAID plays such a critical role from an upstream prevention perspective, if you could talk a little bit more about how atrocity prevention is being integrated uh, throughout the agency when it comes to both humanitarian and development programs uh, to address the structural and upstream issues. Sure. So, hello, uh, I'm Ryan, and I hope, uh, hope you can see me. Um, but uh, first of all, I want to say thanks a lot for Naomi and Philippe and the rest of the team. There's a lot that goes on to make something like this happen, get my bald head not shiny and things like that. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah, uh, to answer your question or to sort of respond to it, it's actually a larger, it, it puts into perspective a larger um, challenge that we have as we roll out this new Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization. And I think there's, for us, there's three main challenges that we, that sort of, uh, uh, we have to sort of work around, but there are several opportunities as well. So the first one, of course, is that, um, you know, we don't have any dedicated funding specifically for this particular issue set. Uh, and so it requires a lot of creative thinking and a lot of uh, communication about how this uh, particular problem set, which is incredibly important, uh, particularly on a prevention perspective, can be integrated into our work. Um, and so uh, it's always a challenge to raise awareness within an agency that already has such a broad mandate where so many things are, are already kind of crisis uh, related and crisis response. Um, and that's also true among our partners who do not live and breathe this sort of atrocity prevention space all the time. Uh, the, the other challenge, of course, is the growing urgency and the number of actual and potential cases that uh, mass atrocities and, and or, or um, you know potential mass atrocities that that are have been cited by others today, uh, and we can talk about a little bit more. On the, other, on the other hand, there's a lot of uh, really interesting opportunities. The first, of course, is the leadership and commitment that this administration uh, has, has shown. Um, uh, and, and as you mentioned, that's gone back uh, to previous administrations as well. But I really want to credit uh, Assistant Secretary Natali and our colleagues at CSO, NSC, other members of the task force for that. I think that the, uh, the rubric that she uh, started with around prevent, protect, and prosecute is really useful. And so I've been scribbling on my notes to kind of reorganize my, my, uh, my discussion around that. Um, I, I also alluded to this along the way, which is that USAID has done its own internal reorganization. And we created this new Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization, going back to uh, what Ambassador Tan said about uh, an ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. We're really good at throwing pounds of cure at things uh, without, uh, without the, focusing on the prevention. So the whole intent of that is to elevate this, uh, you know, the, the, the perspective around prevention. And I think we've learned a lot actually from the, uh, from, from our, uh, the communities, including the Holocaust Museum and others who have really been focused on, uh, on prevention for uh, longer, I think, than we have in some ways. Um, it also better aligns with, you know, the, the, the Olympic Sale Act, the Global Fragility Act, Women, Peace, and Security. So there's a lot that's sort of on the table that, that goes into this. We uh, depend a lot on the strong communication, advocacy, and information sharing by uh, many of the people around the table here, obviously, but also uh, robust uh, uh, advocacy and, uh, and implementation from a variety of organizations, uh, including uh, many of our implementing partners. And uh, we just hats off to the Holocaust Museum for the early warning project, which has affected some of our programming, which I'll discuss in a second. Um, USAID's programs uh, also sort of serve, serve within the interagency as a, as a way of ground truthing some of the reporting that we receive, particularly the work that we do outside of national capitals, where it can be some, sometimes very difficult, particularly in like the COVID environment right now, to get um, actual uh, data about what's happening on the ground. So anyway, uh, getting back to the question, how do we integrate? In terms of prevention, 
Our focus uh, is really on mitigating risks and bolstering the resilience uh, to shocks that could lead to the mass atrocities. And the programs that we, uh, that we run are part and parcel of our democracy rights and governance and conflict mitigation programs that are managed by USAID's offices abroad, which we call missions. Uh, to take one example that I know pretty well, um, in Cote d'Ivoire, um, the sort of atrocity risk right now is focused around a particular trigger event, which is the elections that are coming up in that country. USAID has already had a robust elections program in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. It's focused on political transparency and inclusion. But actually, as a result of the Holocaust Museum's really sort of elevating concerns around uh, Cote d'Ivoire, we've worked with our implementers there to uh, include a component to track and counter hate speech and other dangerous communication that would indicate an early warning sign for, uh, for mass atrocity. So that's one way that we're integrating that. In terms of uh, response, again, our mission-based programs working in conflict-affected environments serve as a common platform for us to do that. There are plenty of examples of community-based early warning systems, unfortunately, uh, that have had to proliferate across the Sahel because of the you know, the, the uh, ongoing risks of violent extremism and, uh, and, and just generalized conflict in those countries. And then, of course, in Burma, uh, as well as support for victims of violence in South Sudan and in a variety of other countries around the world. In addition to what our missions do, we also have a specialized capability, pretty sure everyone has heard of it, the Office of Transition Initiatives, which is focused on supporting peaceful political transitions, but has also really devoted a lot of its time and energy on um, the concerns that we have around vulnerable communities and the potential for atrocities. And more recently, uh, I think the focus has been on religious minorities in places like Northern Iraq and Nigeria. Um, the final aspect, while we don't really lead on prosecution for, you know, we're a development agency, that's, that's not how we sort of do our business uh, primarily. We do support recovery uh, from mass violence and the ability of our partner nations to, uh, to approach issues of, of prosecution and, and, and transitional justice. And you asked about transitional justice before. So just to point out a couple of, of, of points of that, um, we, we do have a, you know, a broader range of uh, uh, development tools uh, to promote justice and accountability, as well as rebuilding social cohesion and advancing economic recovery. It's interesting, a lot of those are now tying in a little bit to COVID as well, because we're seeing the inequalities that come from COVID. COVID. But one example that I would give is a couple. Um, one is in Ukraine, where USAID has been focusing on transitional justice for uh, internally displaced uh, and conflict-affected people, particularly who, uh, who have been affected by the conflicts in the Donbass and uh, Crimea regions. Um, and that, if you think about sort of transitional justice from that perspective, it kind of hits all of them at once. If you do it well, it's a way of preventing the cycle from, you know, a sort of tit for tat kind of violence that goes back and forth between the perceived winners and losers uh, as you know political events unfold. It's also, of course, a response uh, to, to what's going on. And then it helps uh, from a psychosocial perspective and from a, a societal perspective with the recovery as well. Um, we have similar programs actually in Latin America, actually well, not similar, but along, along a similar line, complementary programs that support local organizations um, of uh, members of uh, families of uh, people who have been disappeared or you know, suffered from violence, uh, and uh, particularly those organizations that investigate disappearances and trying to, trying to use state-of-the-art technology like DNA uh, you know, investigations as a way of promoting recovery and healing. So that's, uh, that's what I would say on the, in response to that question. A lot more we could go into. Thank you very much for that, Ryan. Um, we are going to transition now to the question and answers uh, from the audience. And uh, I just want to start by thanking USIP for the opportunity for us to engage in this conversation uh, and to go a little bit deeper than the, the latest report um, was able to in terms of the work that the US government is doing to advance atrocity prevention. So we have quite a few questions uh, that are coming in, uh, and I'm going to start with um, one particular question, which I think is very relevant because one of the aims of the Alouise Al Act was also to be able to learn in a more specific, ideally unclassified, but um, manner 
what the U.S. government has been doing in specific countries around atrocity prevention programming. And each of you have spoken in different ways to some of the work that your respective agencies and departments have been doing. But the question in particular was, in which countries did the United States move the needle to change the trajectory away from atrocities since 2016? It's a great question, um, and I am looking to see how to determine who, whether I do the Socratic method uh, and and urge someone to to speak up. Um, I'm going to start maybe by turning to to Steve and Ryan to see if if there is an example. Ryan, you spoke a little bit about the the Cote d'Ivoire case, so why don't we start with Ryan? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a difficult question because the fact it's it's hard to measure the negative of something, and that's something that we all face, I guess, in this in this uh, particular field. But from USAID standpoint, we've um, made concerted efforts to address the underlying drivers and risk factors in many places, and so our contribution is largely, as you talked about, sort of upstream and also downstream periods, so before, sort of before and after, and uh, in the long over the long term, which is you know. Um, consistent with our role as a development agency. We've tracked our impact through our monitoring, evaluation, and learning processes, which we're trying to refine. We have a lot of engagement with our uh, partner uh, community on this. Um, I think the, an example that sort of jumps out is in the Central African Republic, where we've had concerted efforts, and this is uh, in partnership with USIP and several other you know, organizations represented in the task force. Uh, to uh, for some concerted efforts to support early warning systems. I think this was uh, true during the Lord's Resistance Army piece and then more uh, recently uh, because of the civil war uh, in that country or civil conflict. While CAR is still at risk, we've um, seen, seen periods of improved environmental, um, you know, the, the operational environment has, has improved and uh, are tracking risk factors at a program level. And, my own office, you know, we have some, uh, some of, we use some of our people to people reconciliation funds to try to build on the peace process out there and to, um, you know, continue, continue to move the needle forward. Thank you for that one, Ryan. Um, and I think that that's a, an example again of just how uh, long term the engagement needs to be sustained, it needs to be, but also the challenges that you face at various um, moments in terms of even understanding conditions as they evolve on, on the ground. Uh, we had a report that was put out um, from the museum by Charlie Brown uh, that looked at the response by the US government in some of the earlier days to the most recent uh, conflict. And it also pointed to some of the challenges when you actually also don't have as strong of a physical footprint uh, on the ground to, to be able to get some of the information, which leads me to a question uh, around COVID and the implications of COVID to atrocity prevention programming, but also to data collection. And maybe in that regard, I'll turn to uh, Steve for, for your first initial thoughts there. Well, thanks so much for that. Uh, uh, the COVID, uh, COVID is obviously proposing a, challenge to all of us in the U.S. government. I mean, thankfully, as my boss, the Assistant Secretary of Bureau, likes to say, I guess there's the silver lining of the COVID uh, challenges. It's forced uh, much of the U.S. government, including uh, the State Department, to get up to speed in the 21st century in technology such as the one we're using now to meet virtually. And we, for example, uh, just uh, this week uh, carried on a strategic dialogue with uh, Qatar virtually, as well as partly in person. And so, uh, there are workarounds in some measures, but there are definite challenges. For example, earlier I talked about uh, the state, the training consistent with the Ali Vizella Act and ensuring that foreign service officers have what they need to identify potential conditions of atrocity, uh, mass atrocities, and, and sort of the language, the indicators of potential ways to, to prevent atrocities. But obviously there is no substitute for face-to-face -face contact, not only in the case of training of foreign service officers, but also face-to-face -face contact with uh, interlocutors, host country interlocutors on the ground, both the government actors, the security forces actors, uh, but also the, the non-state actors, the NGOs, the community leaders, 
uh, establishing those personal relationships are critical, not only to uh, gaining information about potential atrocity situations, ongoing atrocities, but also as a way of uh, 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 kind of convening, facilitating engagement between parties that could potentially be uh, on the receiving and delivering end of those atrocities. So we're all waiting to get past uh, the current COVID crisis so that we can get back to the, uh, business diplomacy and uh, carry out uh, the business the American taxpayers are paying us under the Elvizel Act. Um, but in the short term, I'd say we also are, are the work we do virtually and albeit limited to COVID is enhanced by the programming that we do. Colleagues from USAID and Ambassador Tan kind of laid out some of the programs where we've made differences. We think we've made differences, although it's, uh, it is hard to measure a negative. But I think it is measurable, the success, even amid this COVID, if you look at our ability to support civil society, documentation groups, uh, other non-state actors and engage, community leaders that are able to engage with governments, uh, even if, because the groundwork we laid through our programming and other efforts. Um, and so it's difficult, while it's difficult to measure success in the case of atrocities prevention, because it is measuring a negative, we can measure the success of the extent to which U.S. government has, has uh, put up a unified front in supporting uh, those actors, those factors, communities, uh, various leaders on the ground uh, that undoubtedly are uh, key elements of atrocities prevention. So thanks for the question. Ryan, uh, do you want to jump in from USAID's perspective? Sure. Uh, uh, and, and I think this is in a, of a piece with some of the discussions that we were talking about uh, that, that uh, the DOD and uh, INL in particular are, are, uh, are working with with respect to security forces. I mean, I think the COVID-19 COVID has um, created a real opportunity for more autocratic uh, governments, obviously, to crack down on basic freedoms. And so that has been a challenge. And I think it's a, it's a credit to the work that our colleagues are doing in terms of um, uh, security force assistance that that uh, you know the attention to human rights uh, by in those uh, efforts has set the scene in some ways for us to to have some open space. I think it, the example I was going to just present was in South Sudan, where we've um, used some of our uh, rapid response uh, resources for COVID in a democracy and governance uh, um, channel, I guess, to help ensure that some of the some of the the uh, messaging that's going into sort of basic health and sanitation around COVID is also um, being targeted to those communities that have been affected by, um, you know, by uh, atrocities and, and uh, mass violence in, in that country in particular. Uh, so, so sort of ensuring that that vulnerable population is one of the key populations that's getting the information that's needed about that, but also trying to use that as a way of, I guess, sort of bolstering our response on trauma healing and, uh, you know, uh, documentation of some of the challenges uh, that have been sort of pre-existing the COVID era. So, Ryan, you had mentioned before just um, an issue around funding and um, in the report it, it referenced that $10.5 million has been allocated by USAID and state to atrocity prevention efforts. and. I think one of the questions that the COVID period begs um, is whether or not we will see uh, an even greater investment in supporting local civil societies so that they can enhance their own uh, documentation, collection of information, but also coming up with new creative technological advances and strategies for sharing information from the ground, because irrespective of whether or not COVID persists for another six months or or we're in this situation for a number of years, there has been a lot of changes and you referenced increasing authoritarian governments that are taking great strides to prevent uh, local civil society organizations from sharing information uh, from their stories to be told. Uh, Xinjiang, which uh, Denise mentioned at the beginning is one of the most perfect examples there. So it strikes me that this is an area where COVID is forcing um, hopefully a lot of innovation on the part of the U.S. government working with, with partners to try to find long-term solutions, uh, those that may require additional funds and, and uh, ideally those where um, we can be creative and innovative and, and not have to, to 
find the, the money for it because we know how difficult that often is. I wanted to um, go to a, a question that was touching on one of the themes that we started uh, the original discussions with, and I apologize, I'm reading off of, of my phone here. Uh, the question is, what happens when discussion of mass atrocities is too politically sensitive to address with our foreign counterparts, or even too politically sensitive to address within our own interagency? And I think that's uh, a question that many of us often ponder and, and grapple with. Um, we know that the task force is led by uh, the White House. Uh, we know that there is in the latest report, the reference to four meetings that happen that are convened by, by CSO. Uh, we discussed earlier some of the challenges around the regional functional divide and how to overcome that. Uh, I wonder if I can maybe turn to Steve and also David, just from the, the DOD perspective to, to touch on, on these questions of, of what to do with the difficult conversations with uh, foreign governments, but also within the interagency system. Thank you. Well, it's a great question. I, uh, my experience uh, as a career diplomat is that uh, whereas sometimes um, subjects, difficult subjects, sensitive subjects can be uh, very difficult to raise, very challenging to raise with foreign interlocutors and sometimes in the interagency, it's almost rarely impossible to raise. That's really where sort of when you are able to go to uh, partner governments, to contacts on the ground, to colleagues in the interagency, it's a, it's a, like all diplomacy, it's a matter of uh, relationship building of, um, over, a, of, over the span of, of careers of those of us in government. Uh, just like raising difficult issues within a family or community outside of government. So obviously, um, the more information we have from the Holocaust Museum, from USIP, other partners on the ground here, but also the international implementers and partners we work with overseas, the more accurate information, more credible information, the easier uh, avenue we have to go to either foreign interlocutors, host government, partner government, it's abroad, or interagency colleagues and say, here's the situation. Here's, uh, as I said earlier, here's the strategic context, not only why it's in the US government's interest to, to prevent this atrocity, to redress this human rights abuse. We go to our uh, uh, host government uh, interlocutors with whom we continually, because of our US missions abroad, maintain not only that close uh, policy level uh, diplomatic relationship, but also many cases what we pay foreign service officers abroad to do all the time is develop that close rapport with their foreign contacts and say, can we talk? We've got some information here. It's not only in our interest as the US government, but it's also in your government's interest to take up this subject. And it, there's a cyclical relationship there quite often when you go back to their agency where it may be difficult to discuss a topic at times because the competing interests. If the, if the footwork has been done, if that relationship build, building has been done abroad in both governments and non-governments, you raise, it, you raise it to your, your agency colleagues and say, hey, this is what's going on and this is why we need to take a look at it. I tell you, in most cases, if not all, uh, good partnerships inside the US government and outside result in a, a willingness to speak candidly, to hear you out privately at first, but uh, um, it's just part of the work of diplomacy, if that makes sense. David, your perspective, because I know that, that especially that last point about building rapport, uh, at many moments we we turn to DOD and DOD colleagues because of the deep relationships you have to speak with other governments, but there are also challenging moments uh, within the interagency process where DOD may come down on a, a different side of perhaps some of the folks at, at DRL. So curious how you, you look at that issue. Um, sure, thank you. So. Um... As I noted earlier, I mean, we are working to continue to improve training of all of our people who are out in the field. I think these kinds of issues are one more of the one of the one of the issues that we need to focus on. Um, we do our I mean, these folks who are in the field are already fairly well trained. We have a cadre of uh, what we call foreign area officers who select to go into 
career fields where they um, specialize in the language, um, they understand the local culture, um, you know, all of those different issues. They do field work to build their skills up. And those are the folks who are representing, you know, our DOD uh, in uh, the embassy country team. And they do, in fact, develop, you know, very good relationships with their defense counterparts. Um, but, you know, more broadly, um, you know, as, as Steve's noted, you know, this is fundamentally a State Department issue. Um, and they are trained diplomats and they, they lead on these issues. Um, we will support them on the occasion where through the Atrocity Early Warning Task Force, we may have, you know, a different view than perhaps any other agency. Um, you know, we will, we will bring that to the meeting and we'll, we'll have that discussion. But at the end of the day, it rises up to an NSC decision and, and DOD will play its role. Naomi, may I just add one more? This is Steve, may I add just one more thought on that? Yes, please do. I, I should also say David's point is uh, one of my great pleasures and honors in, as a foreign service officer, having served overseas tours, is to serve with DOD uh, foreign area officer uh, counterparts. And I got to tell you, if it gets to the situation you described where it's very difficult to raise a subject with a host government, with a foreign service officer and a foreign area officer going in and talking to their counterparts in the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it becomes a lot easier because the U.S. government puts on a unified front and it really is one team, one fight. And that impresses the host government. The host government wants to have a, that good relationship with the United States and they do their best to reciprocate in most cases. Really appreciate those examples because uh, I think it does underscore again the the point that you're looking for a whole of system, whole of government response, and that uh, policy is set at so many different levels. Uh, we often focus on the, on the principles, but it is the day to day work that is being done on the ground that often can have the determining uh, impact and effect on what might potentially unfold and whether or not the U.S. government is able to help have a preventive role. Uh, and in that vein, it also means that embassies play such a critical role. And hopefully through the LEWs Act, which is, I think, a starting point for trying to really institutionalize training, we'll see a much broader and consistent, hopefully in future years, expansion of that training to, to reach not just those going to high risk countries, but uh, that this is something that is part of uh, all incoming U.S. government officials uh, training and, and preparation, irrespective of whether or not they're going to Treasury, State, uh, DOD, um, I know anywhere that they're going to be situated. Morris, I had a question for you, um, and it's something that's been uh, in the news quite a bit, um, and it pertains to what the U.S. relationship with the International Criminal Court uh, will look like uh, going forward. Uh, of course, the court does have within it a component where they talk about the uh, importance of prevention. And we know that in the history of the court, there have been uh, statements made um, to put potential perpetrators on notice, uh, even prior to crimes taking place. You spoke quite a lot about the U.S. government's support for innovative new mechanisms to document and collect evidence. Uh, some of those uh, mechanisms have been created as a a bit of a workaround because we don't have uh, always opportunities to have forums where you can actually prosecute individuals at the moment. So it, there's the hope that in the future one can. And the international criminal component has always been seen as one of the core components of an architecture of both prevention, prosecution, and, and response. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the U.S. relationship uh, there and with other related uh, justice mechanisms. Thank you for your question, Naomi. I want to address this from a number of different angles. First of all, let me say that we share the core atrocity crime justice uh, seeking that is built into the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court. And it's my office in particular that is seeking uh, to help prevent, mitigate, and address and provide accountability for mass atrocity crimes going on around the world, genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, and, and also uh, uh, war crimes. And so this is something that is shared, is shared very much throughout the US government, I think in Congress, in the State Department, elsewhere, uh, on very much of a bipartisan basis, uh, regardless of whichever party may be. 
uh, in charge in a particular administration. Um, with that said, I would also say another bipartisan matter is to um, see to it that uh, American personnel is held accountable domestically uh, by our very capable and uh, in, in a lot of ways exemplary system that is held up as a model around the world with tremendous capacity. And so uh, that's where some of this trouble has come uh, in, in terms of more recently with respect to the ICC. We have in the past uh, supported various uh, efforts of the ICC in the three convictions on substantive crimes that they've had. Uh, we've assisted with two of them and we've helped in various ways in the past. Having said that, we're, we're in a challenging situation right now because the situation in Afghanistan, uh, our personnel have been uh, consistently included in that preliminary investigation. It didn't have to be. They could have been offloaded earlier. Uh, they could be offloaded even now, uh, but that hasn't happened. And that means that our personnel has been at risk of prosecution in uh, before the ICC. And might I add in ways that would fall below the constitutional standards that we have in our domestic system, whether it's the right to trial by jury or other uh, protections that our constitution provides. And so um, it has been a challenging situation. Uh, we believe in the US government that this interference uh, by the ICC, where they're not respecting complementarity, gravity, uh, or the interests of justice, is making it harder for the US to be able to help prevent uh, these mass atrocity crimes and mitigate these mass atrocity crimes around the world because uh, there's no country that has more of these ideals as well as the capacity to be able to help prevent these sorts of mass atrocity crimes going on around the world and if the ICC is going to uh, ironically enough use our own public documents to be able to try to mount a uh, uh, a case eventually potentially against uh, U.S. personnel, that is something that the president and the secretary deem to be uh, utterly unacceptable. And we are seeking not only to uh, keep that from happening in this instance, but to keep it from being possible moving forward. And we're looking forward to a day when the ICC will not be diverting its uh, rather limited resources uh, to such misadventures, but would be um, really focused more on uh, on the core mission that it has. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Morris, for your for your candor in in kind of outlining uh, your perspective on on that particular issue. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it's an example of the divergence of views that many have uh, working within the atrocity prevention field on the various tools that uh, exist and that are available to help prevent atrocities. Uh, and where I think, as you noted before, um, there is common cause in trying to make sure that we are able to help strengthen the international architecture for prevention and better understand how the US government can play uh, a role in doing that. Uh, I think that we are are now kind of at time. I would like to thank uh, USIP for convening today's discussion. As I mentioned before, it's been the first uh, public opportunity to explore the work of the task force uh, to understand better uh, how this administration has been approaching atrocity prevention efforts. Uh, and to begin to delve more deeply into some of the components that were outlined in the U.S. government's report to Congress on this. I uh, really want to, to thank all of you for participating in it. Uh, very much want to thank your teams for the hard work that you are all doing uh, around the world in trying to advance atrocity prevention. Uh, and also thank uh, our colleagues uh, at SFRC, HVAC, and throughout Congress who have been steadfast in their commitment to trying to make never again uh, a reality. 
and who, as a result, um, were able to help pass groundbreaking uh, legislation that has allowed us to, to come together. I hope that we have an opportunity for future discussions. I think a lot of themes emerged uh, from this, um, including the ongoing questions around the regional functional divides, the future of DOD's efforts. Uh, I know that there has been Yeoman's work done to try to advance uh, protection of civilians training and looking at assets from early warning. Morse, you raised the, the very difficult uh, conversations around uh, international justice. So I think there is a lot here um, to build on. And then of course, uh, the core of so much of the prevention work rests uh, on those who are working on the ground. And USAID uh, has been doing so much of that work, uh, the Department of State, and then of course, INL with all the training that you're doing. Uh, there is always more that can be done. Our role as an institution, as the US Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum is to always strive to uh, endeavor to do better because tragically we live in a world where now we know that the types of crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity are committed no longer just by state uh, forces, but also by non-state actors. Uh, we live in a world where with increasing complexity, the manner in which these crimes are being committed is rapidly evolving. And where at times it often feels as though the the will of those intent on perpetrating the crimes is sometimes greater or the uh, resources that they have are, are more um, expansive than at times we feel like we have in our ability to prevent. So we have to continue to endeavor to deepen our commitments uh, and work in a collaborative way with government, civil society. Uh, so thank you very much for, for this conversation. And thank you, USIP, for your continued uh, work and focus from the Genocide Prevention Task Force up until today. Thank you, Philippe, Lauren, and for everyone who was involved in uh, pulling together this conversation. Uh, and thank you to Denise Natali, her team, uh, and to all of our US government colleagues. Thank you. Take care.